Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to Sweetwater's Guitars and Gear. This time out on Guitars and Gear, we are joined by Joe Lewis Walker, blues man extraordinaire. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you being here. So you're, you're uh, gigging here in uh, Fort Wayne tonight. Yes, we have a nice uh, uh, venue we're playing at, C2G, and uh, we're looking forward to doing it. That's going to be great. Yeah. That's going to be great, yeah. So I want to begin with congratulating you. Uh, the Blues Hall of Fame induction just a few days ago, right? And I ain't even dead. <laughs> there you go. That's a beautiful thing, right? <laughs> you get to enjoy it. I get to enjoy it for a while. Right, right. Yeah. Well, that's tremendous. Congratulations well, on that. That's, thank a, you. that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. yeah. So you started uh, in San Francisco. Yes, I correct. Did. Mm -hmm. And must have been quite the child prodigy because by the time you were 16, you were playing in the Matrix Club. Well, I, I was, um, you know, I, I was fortunate. All my cousins were musicians. I had five cousins. And uh, only two of us play now, uh, two of them are, are gone. And uh, my other cousin, he's not in the music, although he's still, man, my brother, he's not in the music anymore, but mm -hmm. all of us played music. Um, but I guess me being the youngest of the litter, I, I sort of got everybody's you know, influences and all my sisters and my mom and father. Sure. So it, it was um, real easy for me to, to get into it. and. You know, I'm, I'm a fan more than I am a musician. Right. I don't know about that. Yeah. Great musician, too. Well, thank you. So you started out at the Matrix Club. You were backing up people like Lightning Hopkins, Willie Dixon, Muddy Waters, the Fred, whole... The Fred whole, McDowell. All those guys. Yeah, that must have been just amazing as a 16-year-old to be playing with, uh, with artists like that. Yeah. And getting some, you know, uh, uh, how they dealt with... Uh, the change in music business because when those guys started, all those older guys, and I mean, I was always the younger guy in the room, always right. the youngest guy. I mean, 16, sure. you know, but I mean, I was sort of one of those guys who always wanted to be, you know, when, when you're young, you always want to be older, and then when you're older, you want to be younger. Right. <laughs> you know? So I was always that guy, and so you know, if, if it was somebody to go, well, go out and go get us this, Joe, right? You know, Jimmy Rogers would say, Well, Joe, go get me that, or or, or, or Hubert Sumlin would say, well, go pick, me, pick that up for me, and then I'd run and get them cigarettes and, and, you know, whatever else they wanted, barbecue. I'd get Arrow Hooker barbecue. Right. And so, and then if I could play, you know, that was a, a, um, icing on the cake, and when they seen that I could play a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, they were like, oh, okay, you know, you just, you're like the young bull and the old bull, you know, you're in a hurry too much. Try to slow it down, you know. Right. Try to, you know, and so I got a, I think I learned more from being around musicians like that from what they told me other than what they showed me. Mm -hmm. you know? Right, so they're kind of passing along philosophy of how, yeah. to, how to approach yeah. the whole thing. Right, right. And uh, then in the uh, late 60s, you had a very famous roommate, Michael Bloomfield. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. How, did, how, did, uh, how did you guys meet? Well, it, it was, it's funny, I, I, I was performing with, with a, general, a young guy from Chicago uh, about my age, named Johnny Kramer, and it just, he's a great piano player, and it just so happened that his cousin, which I never knew, you know, he, his cousin was a guy named Barry Goldberg, mm -hmm. and he was an organ player, and he had, had a group, and all those uh, Chicago transplants who moved to the West Coast, they moved for the weather and the freedom, and, and, uh, and so um, he says, well, you know, my, my, my cousin, man, he, he, he has a group with a guy named Steve Miller, Steve Miller, Barry, called the Miller Goldberg Blues Band. But he says he really plays with a guy named Mike Bloomfield. I said, I know what Mike Bloomfield is. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to see the Butterfield Band, and, and right. he says, well, you know, I'm, you know, I, I, my, he says, I'm, well, we're all like family. So I, I went and seen the Butterfield Band for the first time on a Thursday night at the Film Auditorium, and, uh, and uh, seeing someone like Bloomfield, a younger guy, playing like that, um, was uh, everybody I know who's seen him, and I wasn't the only one there. A lot of my friends were there. J I think Jerry Miller from Moby Grape was there. Mm -hmm. I think Yorma was there. A, a lot of musicians were there, mm -hmm. you know, because everybody said, well, what's all the fuss about? Right. And it was like somebody had you by the throat, just huh. wouldn't let you go. Because, I mean, he just, it was uh, one thing to see somebody play a guitar and, and, you know, they play within themselves, you know, and you see younger guys from the West Coast trying to play blues, and especially the sort of hippie guys. I mean, I got it from my dad, so I, I was playing people on Walker when I was 14. Mm -hmm. But most of the other guys, they learned their blues, you know, from the Stones and people like that, which is great. Sure. You know, and God bless Mick and Keith and, and the Yardbirds and all those cats for bringing it back. But um, to see a younger guy like Buddy, uh, Mike Bloomfield play like that, I'd only seen a couple other guys play like that, and, and one was Buddy Guy, mm -hmm. you know, to play like just, just free. You know, just flat out flying, and and um, and so it was. But Buddy was another generation. Uh, 
Michael was maybe five years older than me. I think he was born in 43, I was born in 49. Okay. Six years older. So it was, uh, it, it transformed. Uh, I know a lot of people that seen that band, the Butterfield Blues Band, that uh, really um, transformed how they went about playing. It, st it stopped a lot of San Francisco guys from trying to play the blues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, uh oh, right. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's a lot of the Chicago bands that came out traditionally. You see Muddy all the time. Bill Graham loved Albert King. I see Freddie. I played Freddie's guitar. Let me play his guitar. Mm -hmm. Albert, he loved Albert King. Bill Graham, uh, um, uh, Cotton, James Cotton was a big star because Albert Grossman managed him. Uh -huh. And Albert Grossman, of course, we know managed Bob Dylan and, and then Janis Joplin. Uh, but nothing like the Butterfield Blues Band. It was just transformational, uh, first mixed blues band of its kind. Mm -hmm. uh, and the difference, I think, between, uh, it wasn't too many guitar heroes then, you know, really like it is now. You've got everybody from uh, Johnny Mars to Slash. Everybody's sure. a guitar hero. Right. But then it was like, uh, those guys played every night, uh, Michael Bloomfield and Elvin Bishop. And, and, uh, and I think the difference between them and say someone from England, you know, who, whoever you want to pick, if you want to pick uh, Alvin Lee, God rest his soul, great guitar mm -hmm. player. Uh, of course, Eric Clapton comes to mind, Peter Green. Sure. And I think the big difference was that all those guys the, in these states, uh, Elvin Bishop, uh, Smo Little Smokey Smothers was his mentor, Earl Hooker loved him. With Michael, I mean, Muddy Waters was like, you know, his mentor, his pops, and and Sonny Land Slim and, and Eddie Clean Head Vincent, and he also made records with all of them. Uh -huh. So, you know, it was, a, it was a different thing, whereas most of the English guys learned their blues off record. Uh, but later on, I guess Sonny Boy Williamson did move to, to, uh, to uh, uh, London, and he made a, a very famous record of Sonny Boy Williamson and the Yardbirds, mm -hmm. which is a pretty good record. Uh, it was okay. But uh, they, I, I, they weren't around those guys every day. Right. Yeah, and, and whereas Michael and Butterfield, Elvin Bishop, and people like that were. Sure. And uh, I think that that's what really, um, uh, it, it's like playing in the NBA, and you see uh, teams in Italy and, and all these places, and they play good. They're sure. great NBA players. But you put them on the floor here, and they're going to have a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> sure. Because it's yeah. not the stuff that you learn, you know, in practice. It's, it's uh, the stuff that you learn in all the adverse conditions and what have you. Right. So uh, it, it was definitely... Um, be, living with Michael was uh, uh, a real reality check for me. Mm -hmm. You know, being a young guy, thinking that what we were playing then was blues, and then, you know, all the people came to stay at the house. I mean, you'd wake up and there'd be Carrie Bell, or, you know, some of Muddy Waters' band would be sleeping at the house, or, right. you know, or Mick Taylor, you know, or whoever, yeah. Al Cooper, you know. Sure. Even, everybody came to pay homage to him, and uh, he was the reluctant guitar hero. Mm -hmm. Didn't like it at all. <laughs> Did not like one minute of it, you know. Uh, but what can you say? You know? Yeah, right, right. He kind of achieved that. So yeah, yeah. So it, it seems like what you're talking about is more of a, a direct connection to that yeah. true heritage. And, yeah. But you've had a lot of that too because you played yeah. on albums. You played on a Grammy-winning album with BB King, mm -hmm. Grammy-winning album with James Cotton, yeah. and uh, and also you did an album called Great Guitars. Where you had a bunch of different yeah. musicians come in there, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, there was a, a Gatemouth Brown was on there, uh, uh, Steve Cropper, and... Uh, a little Charlie Beatty. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Bonnie Raitt was on that album. There was Mike a Turner. Yeah, whole list of, uh, whole list of great players. Yeah. What's it like to interact with those players as a musician when you're, when you're uh, doing a duet like that? Well, well, you know, it's just like I said, I, I always felt like I was the youngest guy in the room going to get coffee. <laughs> right. I mean, when, you, when you're around Robert Jr. Lockwood, you know, you just listen, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then, of course, and, you know, and you do something, and of course he's going to tell you you're doing it wrong. But it, you know, <laughs> it, when he shows you how to do it right, and you know, he's just sort of pushing your buttons. But it's like you know, I always dealing with someone like Gate Mouth or Robert Jr. It was like dealing with my uncle. You know, I mean, you know, they 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 know you can get it, but you're not applying yourself. You know, so <laughs> get it right. You know, right. and you know, it, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's it's good because where they're coming from is that they want you to achieve what you're trying to achieve, mm -hmm. but they don't want to make it too easy. <laughs> right. You got to do the work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and, and to be quite honest, you know, I think 
what 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 I what I enjoy with something like that and, and all the collaborations is that everybody approaches the same thing a different direction, mm -hmm. you know, and and where you know you, you, what I like is guys that have their own style, mm -hmm. you know, and and I, I think that the the there's a there's a big um, advantage to the technological era that we're living in, but there's a gigantic disadvantage, and that is. Uh, individuality mm -hmm. because you'll get a guitar player and he'll sit and he'll listen to Stevie Ray, he'll listen to Gary Moore, he'll listen to Joe Louis Walker, he'll listen to, he'll listen to Buddy Guy, he'll listen, and a guy can't find his own style. You know, I know you, you've gone to shows where somebody's playing, well, one song he plays like this guy, one song he plays like that one guy, and you just want to say, well, man, when are you going to play like you? Right. You know, and, and to some people it's impossible to do because they haven't gotten all the, the, um, the extraneous stuff out there, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get away from it nowadays? You know, right. because it's just, it's, you're inundated. So I, I, I'm fortunate that I grew up at a time where uh, if you, if I play, and believe me, a lot of us come to San Francisco try to play like Bloomfield. Me, Robin Ford, mm -hmm. Carlos Santana, when he had the Santana Blues with so many guys, Chris Kane, younger guys now, younger guys, Jimmy Vivino now, on down, down, down. And, and, and you know, nobody, you, you can't capture somebody else's spirit. It's right. impossible. You can play a little bit like people, but playing like, trying to copy someone's tone, note for note, and, and their, their note for note, is sort of like trying to copy the way somebody talks and walks. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you're not gonna talk like somebody, you're not gonna walk like them. So uh, I guess the best advice I ever got was from Willie Dixon. He said, you know, Joe, you doing a bad version of you is better than you doing a good version of somebody else. Mm. You know, and I can appreciate guys that have made, uh, you know, that have, have uh, taken other styles and mixed them together and, and, and grown into something else. Because we all start off emulating somebody else. Right. But uh, it's, I learned from all those guys that you talked about on great guitars, each one of them, every one of them, had their own style of playing. Steve mm -hmm. Cropper has his own style. Matt Guitar Murphy, uh, of course, Gate Mouth Brown playing with the capo. Right. Robert Junior Lockwood playing the twelve string. Robert Johnson's son. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Taj Mahal. Taj Mahal, sure. Uh, right. Little Charlie Beatty, who is mm -hmm. uh, 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 and Scotty Moore. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and and just on and on and on and on. Bonnie, mm -hmm. she has her own style. You know, what's funny? Me and Bonnie <laughs> learned slide guitar from the same guy, Mississippi Fred McDowell. Uh -huh. And we played totally different. Right. We were born the same year, we've known each other 30 years, and we played totally different. Right. You know, because she brought her personality and I brought my personality to it. Right. So, uh, it's, um, to answer your question, it was really, uh, I wanted to do a record like that with younger guys. And I did something like that on, uh, I did a record called um, Joe Louis Walker's Blues Conspiracy, uh, live on the legendary Rhythm and Blues Cruise. I did it a, a few years ago and I had, Tommy Castro, uh, Mike Zito, oh my goodness, uh, 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 Nick Moss, uh, Paris Slim, Frank Goldwasser from the Managed Boys, a bunch of guys that are, are younger, another generation down. But you know, it's to be seen 20 years from now if they're going to have the impact right. of those guys. Right. I mean, nobody's going to have the impact like Turner. Sure. You know, I mean, he was the original dive bomber with the Wang Bar. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, nobody's going to have the impact of Matt Guitar Murphy, right. Steve Crop, Scotty Moore. Forget it. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's well, a whole different world now. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, uh, it, it's, it's something I really noticed too. Your your, uh, your latest album is Hellfire, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been listening to this uh, the, the past few weeks. And it's something that I noticed there's a lot of different styles of music there. You've got everything from more rock things to gospel type things to uh, shuffle things and all kinds of things. And you're doing everything from very intense solos on the title track to uh, Hendrixy style solo and sing. But you really come through. I can really pick out that it's you playing over each, each of those styles. And you, you've talked about, about this, uh, you know, how you should develop your own style. What advice do you have for somebody who wants to do that? What would you say if someone comes to you and says, okay, I, I believe what you're saying, 100% agree, now how do I do it? Well, I think one way to do it is to, I wouldn't say don't listen to everybody that everybody listens to, you know, because obviously if you're, gonna, if you're gonna put in serious radio or CD, you know, somebody, hey, I mean, I got this hit CD, you know, but what I, what I would say is that everybody's got influences. I got influences, um, you know, guys of generation that are younger than me, friends of Robert Cray has influences uh, in this uh, style of music. Uh, Stevie Ray had influences. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
everybody has influences, but try to soak it all in and then get rid of it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, soak it all in and, and then, you know, uh, just if there's something stock and cliched and something that everybody's doing, try not to do it. And even if it's playing a different style guitar, <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. sure. you know, even if it's playing something else, just, you know, because we all know that, you know, if, if you get one person that's successful, for whatever reasons, whatever a situation arises, then the, uh, people's ears are attuned to that particular thing and somebody's gonna say, well, that's successful, why don't you give us something like that? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but back in the day, you know, um, when you had Scotty Moore and Carl Perkins inventing rockabilly, because they really didn't want to play uh, traditional country all the time, mm -hmm. and they couldn't play blues like those guys, the other blues guys, they invented rockabilly, that was new. Sure. And you had Chuck Berry wanted to play rock and roll like Carl Hogan, play country like Carl Hogan, and, but couldn't, wanted to play blues like, and he tried, mm -hmm. you know? Right. We all know the stories, him going to the country clubs, and says, no, you're not the guy on that record, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and he wanted to play blues like Muddy Waters, his, his idol, and he couldn't, mm -hmm. so he invented rock and roll. Mm -hmm. You know, and it doesn't make any difference who was the king of rock and roll, but we know who invented it. Sure. You know, and that was Chuck Berry, you know. I mean, you get six musicians in a room, classical musician, jazz musician, uh, country musician, funk musician, and you ask them, okay, uh, we're going to play Box Few number three? Or are we going to play uh, Take the A Train? Or are we going to play uh, Smoke on the Water? <laughs> or are we gonna play, um, baby, what you want me to do? Got me running. Everybody's gonna play, baby, what you want me to do. And then they're gonna play Chuck Berry. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then then Gary, everybody right? can go home. <laughs> <laughs> but everybody can play a few notes in that, you sure. know? Sure, sure. So that's like the, the training ground. Right, uh, right, right. So one of the things I think that, that uh, sets you apart from many blues, rock, country musicians, uh, in, in those styles is you took a detour into gospel and at the same time got two college degrees, one in music and one in English. How did that music degree influence what you did as a musician? Well, it, 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 it helped me just enough not to let it ruin my musicianship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know, it's, it's when, when I was a kid, you know, and the, uh, I think my mother did me a big favor and I, I didn't get it at the time, but you know, all my other cousins were musicians and, and you know, uh, they were quitting school and, and, and going on tour, you know, doing tours with, with people, I mean, uh, and I wanted to do that, you mm -hmm. know, but I was like 15 and 14 actually, and my mom said, you know, you're playing these dances, you're, you're sneaking in nightclubs playing and, and, you know, I can't stop you, you know, and my dad didn't even try. You know, he just played the music for me on a, radio, on a record player. And she said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If you're serious about music, you know, um, I want you to go to a teacher once a week, you mm -hmm. know. And, um, but that means you have to sacrifice playing sports. You got to sacrifice hanging out with the fellas and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. you, you know, in other words, it's a job. And, and, right. and you have to learn the language of that job. And so it, it, it I did that for a couple of years, and I left home at 16. And, and, and but uh, when I learned how to play, I got with all my cousins. They were still saying, "Well, we're playing here. We're playing here." They, they really didn't know what C, A, G, D, D flat, uh, you know, a uh, 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 raised nine. They didn't know what any of that stuff. So I sort of sort of schooled my cousins. So so when I, I got to be some, somewhat known uh, in, in my later teens, and, and, and um, I had a career. In, in the 60s and it really didn't, uh, didn't amount to much. And so in the 70s, I, I went to gospel music because I, um, a lot of my friends were dying and, uh, you know, it was pretty excessive. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the people, a lot of people tell me, oh, well, people died when they were 27. Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, uh, Brian Jones, they always forget Al Wilson. I don't know why. He's one of the greatest. Mm -hmm. Can't he? Blah, blah, blah. Jim Morrison. Well, three of those people I knew. Mm -hmm. I knew Jimmy, I knew Janis Joplin, and, and I, I ran across Jim Morrison when I lived in LA. Mm -hmm. I, I never met Brian Jones, although I, I know Mick now and, and Ronnie, very, I've known Ronnie 28 something odd years. 
and um, I, I, I respect all those guys. And then, then uh, Bloomfield died later on, and and when I, the the generation I came up with, it was all new. You know, nobody knew that they were going to be big stars. And I defy anybody to say that Bobby and every and and, and all those guys I lived right around the corner from Bobby wearing them. They did not know. Nobody knew it was going to be huge. Bill Graham had a, had a, had a, you know inkling. I'm sure after the first mind truth thing when he when he when he opened the receipts and saw all the money, he was right. like, oh man, <laughs> you know these guys know what they're doing because everybody they were just playing to you know get a little bit high and and get you know have fun with the uh, the opposite sex and what have you and and be recognized around the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know. So I am I, um, I, I I feel that it's. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a the epiphany for me to leave playing secular music and to play gospel music. Uh, I really feel that that saved my life mm -hmm. because two three two things I'm sure of is that if I'd have made a lot of money when I was young, I'd have been there with Jimmy Hendrix and Janis Joplin. I went to the Chateau Marmont Hotel many times, <laughs> okay, and I went to you know I, I played the whiskey a go go when I was seven. I was in Blue Cheer. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I was in the Oxford Circle. I did a lot of things, you know, and, and never for the grace of God, mm -hmm. you know, and, and some people make it through and some people don't. But one thing I, I do notice is that all those people, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, all of them, they were having such a hard time with success. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, a really hard time. They were happier when they weren't successful, yeah. as strange as that may sound. You know, it, it just, and I know exactly how that feeling is when you start off wanting to play so bad and then you get to a situation in your career where you gotta play because of this contract, because of that musician, or because of this, this manager. And I mean, the, the, obviously the, the, the one that your heart goes out for is Jimi Hendrix, you know? Because mm -hmm. he was going in a different direction and they pulled him back into another direction that he really didn't want to go with uh, a band that really wasn't a band anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like going back to your wife when, when you just, I'm going back for the kids. Well, you, you, you know, nothing good's going to happen for the kids and nothing's good's going to happen for you and your ex-wife. So, uh, too bad he couldn't make it through that. And, uh, yeah, that was same right. with Janis Joplin. She was going through band things, boom, 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 you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, wanted dying to be loved like that song goes, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, great tragedies. What, yeah. what, uh, what losses there. Yeah. But, uh, uh, so since then, uh, you, you came back to the blues, obviously, after about eighty mid eighties or so, and uh, mm -hmm. you've done twenty four albums, yeah, on your own name. And I read somewhere that you've you've guested on like one hundred and forty three different albums. Well, I think it's more than that because some of the tracks were never released that I've guested on. Right, and I did a lot of studio work, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, play, I played bass because that's my first one of my first instruments and on things. Played harmonica on some things, mm -hmm. and, and so. You know, once in, once you get in in, in the studio, I, I think the one thing that I, I'm most proud of as a musician is that guys like uh, Gate Mouth Brown or Robert Jr. Lockwood or Ike Turner, and guys that are Ike Turner, or Matt Murphy, Scotty Moore, would trust me. You mm -hmm. know, because when I when I played on Scotty and DJ's record, All the King's Men, I mean, they they never asked me. You know, Joe, what song? Which song are you gonna do? You know, they just told right. me to write a song, and I'm and I'm the president of Procrastinators Anonymous. Right. I waited till the <laughs> night before to write the song. Right. Scotty didn't know it, and I wasn't gonna tell him. <laughs> it's a little and he, I mean, he loved the song. You know, him and DJ. You know, and, and straight on the studio, right. no overdub, no. You know, you know. I, I remember I was going in the booth when I was making the record with Scotty and DJ, and. This guy said, well, where are you going? I said, well, I'm, I'm going in the booth. You know, I'm singing. I got a separation. He said, no, Joe, we don't separate anything. <laughs> <laughs> you got to stand where DJ can see you. <laughs> right, 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 which isn't as common today, is it? Everybody tries oh, to uh, oh. to break things up. That's a great way to do it, though, because then yeah. you really get the feel of a band playing together. You really do. Yeah, yeah, yeah nice. So you mentioned earlier um, playing a different guitar, and you've brought an uh, interesting guitar with you here today. Can you tell us, uh, tell us what you've got here? Well, this is uh, a new model that uh, Gibson and Memphis has made, um, which is a, a, it's a Chris Cornell, uh, a young man who played a, a great singer, mm -hmm. musician, played with Soundgarden. Um, this was his idea, uh, and uh, he, must, he must be thinking sort of similar to me because 
this is a 335, traditional 335, but with filter trons, mm -hmm. but they're just a little bit hotter. Uh, I guess they're Lawler trons, uh, but they're a little bit holler, hotter than your normal Gretsch pick pickups mm -hmm. and be, being in a 335 with 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 the block and the body it's got a little bit more uh, juice to it right uh, but it's got a sweet sound you know a very sweet sound and and I like the sweet sound you know on, on some things mm -hmm. you know and uh, when I played it uh, I, re I really liked it you know I said well it's a, it's a unique sound right you know it, it's it got crunch to it but it's also you can get sweet with it and um, so I've been playing it a bit and uh, really enjoyed it. Yeah. So. Well, it seems very versatile. You were playing a, a bit earlier before we uh, turned the cameras on and doing some kind of clean, jazzy things and then some, mm -hmm. uh, some crunchier things and some lead stuff. And a lot of different sounds are available with those, uh, those filter trunches. There's a nice bite to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, I think you have to have a sort of a, a, a context to use it in. Uh, uh, but I, I've played it. I'm not a real jazz player. Uh, I, I know a few licks, but I'm, I'm not someone like you know, Larry Coryell or somebody like that. But, but uh, it, it's, uh, I think for, for jazz, you might like a little bit of a darker sound. Sure. Uh, but for just about everything else, um, this is, uh, it, it's, it's not your traditional Gibson sound. It's, it's just the, I, I guess the word I'm looking for, it's, it's a mix mm -hmm. of a couple of things, you know. Right, mm -hmm. right. Yeah, nice, nice. And you're also known for playing uh, Les Pauls. Yeah. Also, you've yeah. been uh, you played a lot of those over there. I like the one that's on the uh, the cover here. I don't yeah. know if you can see it, but it looks like too many humbuckers and then a humbucker in the uh, the yeah. middle position as well. Sort of a different yeah. arrangement there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I did some little uh, Frankenstein stuff there with it. Right. Actually, it's, I think it's uh, three three mini humbuckers. Is it three mini humbuckers? Yeah, he just put a different uh, uh, pickup different, holder. Oh, okay. Middle. Yeah. But yeah, it's three mini humbuckers, uh, and it, it, that, that 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 had had, had a unique sound. I am. Um, Gave that guitar to a good friend of mine, Jimmy Vivino, who I'm mm -hmm. 25. Gave that guitar to him. Nice. Uh, as nice a present. Nice Christmas present. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Joe Lewis, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Well, thank you. Congratulations man. on all your success. Induction into the Hall of Fame. I appreciate You've got it. BMA awards and BMA nominate 43 BMA nominations or, or even more. Mm -hmm. Tremendous career, tremendous life. And uh, actually, I read somewhere that you were uh, going to write an autobiography. I hope you'll do that. Uh, at, get at that some done point. soon. Every yeah. time I think about doing it, something else happens. You've got to do know. that, though. Yeah. You got to do that because yeah. it's such a such a tremendous history there. So thanks so much for coming in. Really, I really, really appreciate it. Everybody here at Sweetwater, and thank you for having me. Absolutely, our pleasure. For sure. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for Guitars and Gear. Be sure to tune in next time. We'll have more guitars. We'll have more amps, and we'll be making lots of music. <laughs>